back again with Matilda today. So we're gonna go ahead and read the next two chapters. Um, just a little recap of what happened yesterday in our story. So um, Matilda uh, is really, really thriving in school and Miss Honey took a trip to her parents' house to let them know that and they weren't very receptive to that. So they were not very happy that she came over and told them how much she appreciated Matilda's talents. And then the next chapter after that, Matilda and her new friend Lavender were talking to an older girl who was giving them more information about the Trunchbull. And the Trunchbull ended up throwing one of the little kiddos across the playground. She is not a nice lady. She also told them about the Chokey, which is where the Trunchbull puts her naughty students. So we're gonna go ahead with the next chapter. Okay. Bruce. Bog Trotter and the Cake. How can she get away with that? Lavender said to Matilda. Surely the children go home and tell their mothers and fathers. I know my father would raise a terrific stink if I told him the headmistress had grabbed me by the hair and slugged me across the playground fence. No, he wouldn't, Matilda said, and I'll tell you why. He simply wouldn't believe you. Of course he would. He wouldn't, Matilda said, and the reason is obvious. Your story would sound too ridiculous to be believed, and that is the Trunchbull's great secret. What is? Lavender asked. Matilda said, never do anything by halves if you want to get away with it. Be outrageous. Go the whole hog. Make sure everything you do is so completely crazy it's unbelievable. No parent is going to believe this pigtail story, not in a million years. Mine wouldn't. They'd call me a liar. In that case, Lavender said, Amanda's mother isn't going to cut her pigtails off. No, she isn't, Matilda said. Amanda will do it herself. You see if she doesn't. Do you think she's mad? Lavender asked. Who? The Trunchbull. No, I don't think she's mad, Matilda said, but she's very dangerous. Being in this school is like being in a cage with a cobra. You have to be very fast on your feet. They got another example of how dangerous the headmistress could be on the very next day. During lunch, an announcement was made that the whole school should go into the assembly hall and be seated as soon as the meal was over. When all of the 250 or so boys and girls were settled down in assembly, the Trunchbull marched on to the platform. None of the other teachers came in with her. She was carrying a writing crop in her right hand. She stood up there on center stage in her green breeches with legs apart and a riding crop in hand, glaring at the sea of upturned faces before her. What's going to happen? Lavender whispered. I don't know, Matilda whispered back. The whole school waited for what was coming next. Bruce Brogtrotter, the Trunchbull barked suddenly. Where is Bruce Bogtrotter? A hand shot up among the seated children. Come up here, the Trunchbull shouted, and look smart about it. An 11-year-old boy who was decidedly large and round stood up and waddled briskly forward. He climbed up onto the platform. Stand over there, the Trunchbull ordered, pointing. The boy stood to one side. He looked nervous. He knew very well he wasn't up there to be presented with a prize. He was watching the headmistress with exceedingly wary eye, and he kept edging farther and farther away from her with little shuffles of his feet, rather as a rat might edge away from a terrier that is watching it from across the room. So there's what the Trunchbull looks like. She's got her writing crop in hand, and she is not happy with Bruce. His plump, flabby face <laughs> his plump, flabby face had turned gray with the fearful apprehension. His stockings hung about his ankles. This clot, boomed the headmistress, pointing the riding crop at him like a rapier. This backhead, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule that you see before you is none other than a disgusting criminal, a denizen of the underworld, a member of the mafia. Who? Me? Bruce Brogtrotter said, looking genuinely puzzled. A thief, the Trunchbull screamed. A crook, a pirate, a brigand, a rustler. Steady on, the boy said. I mean, dash it all, headmistress. Do you deny it, you miserable little grumboil? 
Do you plead not guilty? I don't know what you're talking about, the boy said, more puzzled than ever. I'll tell you what I'm talking about, you superating little blister, the trench bull shouted. Yesterday morning, during break, you sneaked like a serpent into the kitchen and stole a slice of my private chocolate cake from my tea tray. That tray had just been prepared for me personally by the cook. It was my morning snack, and as for the cake, it was my own private stock. That was not boy's cake. You don't think for one minute I'm going to eat the filth I give you. The cake was made from real butter and real cream. And he, that robber bandit, that safe cracker, that highwayman standing over there with his socks around his ankles, stole it and ate it. I never did, the boy exclaimed, turning from gray to white. Don't lie to me, Bog Trotter, barked the trench bull. The cook saw you. What's more, she saw you eating it. The trench bull paused to wipe a fleck of froth from her lips. So there's Bruce, all nervous, and there's the trench bull pointing to him with her writing crop. When she spoke again, her voice was suddenly softer, quieter, more friendly, and she leaned towards the boy, smiling. You like my special chocolate cake, don't you, Bob Trotter? It's rich and delicious. Isn't it, Bob Trotter? Very good, the boy mumbled. The words were out before he could stop himself. You're right, the Trunchbull said. It is very good. Therefore, I think you should congratulate the cook. When a gentleman has a particularly good meal, Bob Trotter, he always sends his compliments to the chef. You didn't know that, did you, Bob Trotter? But those who inhabit the criminal underworld are not noted for their good manners. The boy remained silent. Cook, the trench bull shouted, turning her head towards the door. Come here, cook. Bob Trotter wishes to tell you how good your chocolate cake is. The cook, a tall, shriveled female who looked as though all of her body juices had been dried out of her long ago in a hot oven, walked on to the platform wearing a dirty white apron. Her entrance had clearly been arranged beforehand by the headmistress. Now then, Bog Trotter, the trench bull boomed, tell Cook what you think of her chocolate cake. Very good, the boy mumbled. You could see he was now beginning to wonder what all this was leading up to. The only thing he knew for certain was that the law forbade the trench bull to hit him with the riding crop that she kept smacking against her thigh. That was some comfort, but not much, because the trench bull was totally unpredictable. One never knew what she was going to do next. There you are, cook, the trench bull cried. Bog Trotter likes your cake. He adores your cake. Do you have any more of your cake you could give him? And before we flip the page, there's the trench bull talking to Bog Trotter. The smile on her face. Hmm. I do indeed, the cook said. She seemed to have learnt her lines by heart. Then go and get it and bring a knife to cut it with. The cook disappeared. Almost at once, she was back again, staggering under the weight of an enormous round cake on a china platter. The cake was fully 18 inches in diameter and it was covered with dark brown chocolate icing. Put it on the table, the trench bull said. There was a small table center stage with a chair behind it. The cook placed the cake carefully on the table. Sit down, Bog Trotter, the trench bull said. Sit there. The boy moved cautiously to the table and sat down. He stared at the, gig the gigantic cake. There you are, Bog Trotter, the trench bull said, and once again her voice became soft, persuasive, even gentle. It's all for you, every bit of it. As you enjoyed that slice you had yesterday so very much, I ordered Cook to bake you an extra large one all for yourself. Well, thank you, the boy said, totally bemused. Thank cook, not me, the trench bull said. Thank you, cook, the boy said. The cook stood there like a shriveled bootlace, tight-lipped, implacable, disapproving. She looked as though her mouth was full of lemon, ju <laughs> lemon juice. <clears throat> Come on, then, the trench bull said. Why don't you cut yourself a nice thick slice and try it? What, now, the boy said cautious. He knew there was a catch in this somewhere, but he wasn't sure where. Can I take it home instead? He asked. 
That would be impolite, the trench bull said with a crafty grin. You must show Cookie here how grateful you are for all the trouble she's taken. The boy didn't move. Go on, get on with it, the trench bull said. Cut a slice and taste it. We haven't got all day. So there's Cook, and there's the giant cake that they're bringing out to Bruce. The boy picked up the knife and was about to cut into the cake when he stopped. He stared at the cake, then he looked up at the trench bowl, then at the tall, stint, stringy cook with her lemon juice mouth. All the children in the hall were watching tensely, waiting for something to happen. They felt certain it must. The trench pool was not a person who would give someone a whole chocolate cake who, to eat just out of kindness. Many were guessing that it had been filled with pepper or castor oil or some other foul tasting substance that would make the boy violently sick. It might even be arsenic and he would be dead in 10 seconds flat. Or perhaps it was a booby trapped cake and the whole thing would blow up the moment it was cut, taking Bruce Bogtrotter with it. No one in the school put it past the trudge bowl to do any of these things. I don't want to eat it, the boy said. Taste it, you little brat, the trench bull said. You're insulting the cook. Very gingerly, the boy began to cut a thin slice of the vast cake. Then he levered the slice out. Then he put down the knife and took the sticky thing in his fingers and started very slowly to eat it. It's good, isn't it? The trench bull asked. Very good, the boy said, chewing and swallowing. He finished the slice. Have another? the trench bull said. That's enough, thank you, the boy murmured. I said have another, the trench bull said, and now there was an altogether sharper edge to her voice. Eat another slice, do as you are told. I don't want another slice, the boy said. Suddenly, the trench bull exploded. Eat, she shouted, banging her thigh with the riding crop. If I tell you to eat, you will eat. You wanted cake, you stole cake, and now you've got cake. What's more, you're going to eat it. You do not leave this platform, and nobody leaves this hall until you have eaten the entire cake that is sitting there in front of you. Do I make myself clear, Bog Trotter? Do you get my meaning? The boy looked at the trench bull. Then he looked down at the enormous cake. Eat, 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 the trench bull was yelling. Very slowly, the boy cut himself another slice and began to eat it. Matilda was fascinated. Do you think he can do it? She whispered to Lavender. No, Lavender whispered back. It's impossible. He'd be sick before he was halfway through. The boy kept going. When he had finished the second slice, he looked at the trench bull, hesitating. Eat, she shouted, greedy little thieves who like to eat cake must have cake. Eat faster, boy, eat faster. We don't want to be here all day. And don't stop like you're doing now. Next time you stop before it's all finished, you'll go straight into the chokey and I shall lock the door and throw the key down the well. The boy cut a third slice and started to eat it. He finished this one quicker than the other two. And when that was done, he immediately picked up the knife and cut the next slice. In some peculiar way, he seemed to be getting into his stride. Matilda watched closely, saw no signs of distress in the boy. And if anything, he seemed to be gathering confidence as he went along. He's doing well, she whispered to Lavender. He'll be sick soon, Lavender whispered back. He's got to be horrid. When Bruce Bogtrotter had eaten his way through half of the entire enormous cake, he paused for just a couple of seconds and took several deep breaths. The trench bull stood with hands on hips, glaring at him. Get on with it, she shouted, eat it up. Suddenly the boy let out a gigantic belch, which rolled around the assembly hall like thunder. Many of the audience began to giggle. Silence, shouted the trench bull. The boy cut himself another thick slice and started eating it fast. There were still no signs of flagging or giving up. He certainly did not look as though he was about to stop and cry out, I can't eat, I can't eat anymore, I'm going to be sick. He was still there in the running. And now a subtle change was coming over the 250 watching children in the audience. And we're gonna keep going in just a moment, but here's a picture of Bruce trying to eat that whole chocolate cake. 
Earlier on, they had sensed impending disaster. They had prepared themselves for an unpleasant scene in which the wretched boy stuffed to the gills with chocolate cake would have to surrender and beg for mercy, and then they would have watched the triumphant trunchbull forcing more and still more cake into the mouth of the gasping boy. Not a bit of it. Bruce Bogtrotter was three quarters of the way through and still going strong. One sensed that he was almost beginning to enjoy himself. He had a mountain to climb, and he was jolly well going to reach to the top or die in the attempt. What is more, he had now become very conscious of his audience and how they were all silently rooting for him. This was nothing less than a battle between him and the mighty Trunchbull. Suddenly, someone shouted, Come on, Brucie, you can make it! The Trunchbull wheeled around and yelled, Silence! The audience watched intently. They were thoroughly caught up in the contest. They were longing to start cheering, but they didn't dare. I think he's going to make it, Matilda whispered. I think so too, Lavender whispered back. I wouldn't have believed anyone in the world could eat the whole cake that size. The Trunchbull doesn't believe it either, Matilda whispered. Look at her, she's turning redder and redder. She's going to kill him if he wins. The boy was slowing down now. There was no doubt about it but he kept pushing the stuff into his mouth with the dogged perseverance of a long distance runner who has sighted the finish line and knows he must keep going. At the very last mouth, as the very last mouthful disappeared, a tremendous cheer rose up from the audience and children were leaping on their chairs and yelling and clapping and shouting, well done, Brucie, good for you, Brucie. You've won a gold medal, Brucie. So there's the whole audience of kids so excited that he beat the Trunchbull. The Trunchbull stood motionless on the platform. Her great horsey face had turned the color of molten lava and her eyes were glittering with fury. She glared at Bruce Bogtrotter who was sitting on his chair like some huge overstuffed grub, replete, comatose, unable to move or to speak. A fine sweat was beating on his forehead but there was a grin of triumph on his face. Suddenly, the Trunchbull lunged forward and grabbed the large, empty china platter which the cake had rested. She raised it high in the air and brought it down with a crash right on top of the wretched Bruce Brogtrotter's head, and pieces flew all over the platform. The boy was by now so full of cake, he was like a sack full of wet cement, and you couldn't have hurt him with a sledgehammer. He simply shook his head a few times and went on grinning. Go to blazes, screamed the Trunchbull, and she marched off the platform, followed closely by the cook. So there's Bruce Bogtrotter, all proud of himself, and the Trunchbull with the china plate. Looks like he won that one. All right, that's the end of that chapter. We'll read one more today. This chapter is called Lavender. In the middle of the first week of Matilda's first term, Miss Honey had said to the class, I have some important news for you, so listen carefully. You too, Matilda, put that book down for a moment and pay attention. Small, eager faces looked up and listened. It is the headmistress's custom, Miss Honey went on, to take over the class for one period each week. She does this with every class in the school, and each class has a fixed day and a fixed time. Ours is always two o'clock on Thursday afternoons, immediately after lunch. So tomorrow at two o'clock, Miss Trunchbull will be taking over from me for one lesson. I shall be here as well, of course, but only as a silent witness. Is that understood? Yes, Miss Honey, they chirruped. A word of warning to you all, Miss Honey said. The headmistress is very strict about everything. Make sure your clothes are clean, your faces are clean, and your hands are clean. Speak only when spoken to. When she asks you a question, stand up at once before you answer it. Never argue with her. Never answer back. Never try to be funny. If you do, you will make her angry. And when the headmistress gets angry, you had better watch out. You can say that again, Lavender murmured. I am quite sure, Miss Honey said, that she will be testing you on what you were meant to have learned this week, which is your two times table. So I strongly advise you to swat it up when you get home tonight. Get your mother and father to hear you on it. So there's Miss Honey warning the class that Miss Trunchbull is going to be teaching them next week. 
What else will she test us on? Someone asked. Spelling, Miss Honey said. Try to remember everything you have learned these last few days. And one more thing. A jug of water and a glass must always be on the table here when the headmistress comes in. She never takes a lesson without that. Now who will be responsible for seeing that it's there? I will, Lavender said at once. Very well, Lavender, Miss Honey said. I will, it will be your job to go to the kitchen and get the jug and fill it with water and put it on the table here with a clean, empty glass just before the lesson starts. What if the jug's not in the kitchen? Lavender asked. There are a dozen headmistresses' jugs and glasses in the kitchen, Miss Honey said. They are used all over the school. I won't forget, Lavender said. I promise I won't. Already, Lavender's scheming mind was going over the possibilities that this water jug job had opened up for her. She longed to do something truly heroic. She admired the older girl, Hortensia, to distraction for the daring deeds that she had performed in the school. She also admired Matilda, who had sworn her to secrecy about the parrot job she had brought off at home, and also the great hair oil switch which had bleached her father's hair. It was her turn now to become a heroine, if only she could come up with a brilliant plot. On the way home from school that afternoon, she began to mull over the various possibilities, and when at last the germ of a brilliant idea hit her, she began to expand on it and lay her plans with the same kind of care the Duke of Wellington had done before the Battle of Waterloo. Admittedly, the enemy on this occasion was not Napoleon, but you would never have gotten anyone at Crunchham Hall to admit that the headmistress was a less formidable foe than the famous Frenchman. Great skill would have to be exercised, Lavender told herself, and great secrecy observed if she was to come out of this exploit alive. There was a muddy pond at the bottom of Lavender's garden, and this is the home of the colony of newts. The newt, although very common in English ponds, is not often seen by ordinary people because it is a shy and murky creature. It is an incredibly ugly, gruesome looking animal, rather like a baby crocodile, but with a shorter head. It is quite harmless, but doesn't look it. It is about six inches long and very slimy, with greenish gray skin on top and an orange colored belly underneath. It is, in fact, an amphibian, which can live in or out of water. That evening, Lavender went to the bottom of the garden determined to catch a newt. They are swiftly moving animals and not easy to get a hold of. She lay on the bank for a long time, waiting patiently until she spotted a whopper. Then, using her school hat as a net, she swooped and caught it. She had lined her pencil box with pondweed ready to receive the creature, but she discovered that it was not easy to get the newt out of the hat and into the pencil box. It wriggled and squirmed like quicksilver, and apart from that, the box was only just long enough to take it. When she did get it in at last, she had to be careful not to trap its tail in the lid when she closed it. The boy next door called Rupert Inswell had told her that if you chopped off a newt's tail, this tail stayed alive and then grew another newt ten times bigger than the first one. It could be the size of an alligator. Lavender didn't quite believe that, but she was not prepared to risk it happening. Eventually, she managed to slide the lid on the pencil box right home and the newt was hers. Then, on second thoughts, she opened the lid just the tiniest fraction so that the creature could breathe. The next day, she carried her secret weapon to the school in her satchel. She was tingling with excitement. She was longing to tell Matilda about her plan of battle. In fact, she wanted to tell the whole class, but she finally decided to tell nobody. It was better that way because then no one, even when put under the most severe torture, would be able to name her as the culprit. Lunchtime came. Today it was sausages and baked beans. Lavender's favorite, but she couldn't eat it. Are you feeling all right, Lavender? Miss Honey asked from the head of the table. I had such a huge breakfast, Lavender said. I really couldn't eat a thing. Now before we move on, there's Lavender trying hard to get that newt with her hat. Immediately after lunch, she dashed off to the kitchen and found one of the Trunchbull's famous jugs. It was a large, bulging thing made of blue glazed pottery. Lavender filled it half full of water and carried it, together with a glass, into the classroom and set it on the teacher's table. The classroom was still empty. Quick as a flash, Lavender got her pencil box, 
box from her satchel and slid open the lid just a tiny bit. The newt was lying quite still. With great care, she held the box over the neck of the jug and pulled the lid fully open and tipped the newt in. There was a plop as it landed in the water. Then it thrashed around wildly for a few seconds before settling down. And now, to make the newt feel more at home, Lavender decided to give it all the pond weed from the pencil box as well. The deed was done. All was ready. Lavender put her pencils back into the rather damp pencil box and referred returned it to the correct place on her own desk. Then she went out and joined the others in the playground until it was time for the lesson to begin. So there she is dumping the newt into the jug. And that was the end of our next chapter. We'll go ahead with um, reading the rest of this next time. I'm really excited to see what happens with that newt. I hope you guys are having a great day today. I'll see you guys later. Bye.